Good evening. Thanks. Thanks for coming here this evening. Today we have Dr. Lindsley Naylor, uh, Assistant Professor of Geography at the University of Delaware, who is going to be giving a talk on fair rebels, fair trade and movement, and the possibilities of being in common. Dr. Naylor has conducted quite a bit of research in southern Mexico as well as elsewhere, but her, her work in southern Mexico in the southern state of Chiapas, which is an area very rich in natural resources, perhaps the, uh, the, the sole state in Mexico that has an abundance of natural resources, but where there's a significant amount of poverty and a really, really rich concentration of, uh, of indigenous people in the local population. But she'll be talking about this uh, matter of fair trade and the people that are cultivating coffee beans and the ways in which they live. And so I'm gonna ask you to welcome Dr. Naylor uh, with a round of applause. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Lindsay, please, yes. go ahead. <laughs> So thanks so much to Mike for inviting me uh, and for the Grand Rapids community for hosting me. It's been a really incredible couple of days. I've got to meet some really fabulous folks and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I am today gonna be talking about some themes from my forthcoming book, which is a really exciting thing for me to say because I've been working on this research for over a decade and I just got my book cover just in time to share it with everyone. Uh, so I am in this book focused on the production of food and coffee and really thinking about how we can multiply the way that we understand how to live well, to think about multiple knowledges of living well. And so as you can imagine, trying to distill a book into a one hour talk is a, uh, a thankless task. And so I'm just gonna focus in on one chapter and that's what the subtitle of my talk is, the idea of fair trade in movement and the possibilities of being in common. And so this chapter is really concerned with what fair trade can do and the solidarity relations that are forged within economic exchanges like those that we see in fair trade. So uh, today I'll start by uh, introducing people, a place, and ideas, and the people that I worked with when conducting this research. And then I'm gonna put the cart a little bit before the horse and talk about what I mean by possibilities of being in common. Uh, and then I will talk through the core questions that shape my book, what is fair trade, who is it for and who gets to decide. Uh, and then I'm gonna use solidarity as a lens to have this conversation and then I'll just make a few concluding comments and then you can ask me questions if you have any, which I hope you do. Uh, so this landscape of corn and coffee can tell us a number of different things about what's happening in what I'm calling self-declared autonomous communities in the highlands of Chiapas, Mexico. Uh, what you're seeing here speaks to the enduring presence of corn in indigenous communities and its importance as a daily foodstuff. It also shows an income earning strategy. These treed areas back here are shade production of coffee for the fair trade marketplace or for the international marketplace. Uh, but if we take a closer look, this landscape can tell us more. And at first glance, these plots might look the same. Uh, however, some of these plots are producing uh, coffee for in a conventional way, using insecticides and, pest, or, and uh, herbicides. However, some of these are producing in an organic way. Some have fair trade certification and some don't. So even though this landscape may look fairly contiguous and homogenous, uh, some are being cultivated uh, in very different ways. And in fact, some are being cultivated by members of coffee cooperatives who are members also of social movements uh, who have rebelled against the state. Uh, and these actors who I call fair rebels or fair trade rebels are indigenous subsistence and coffee farmers who are in resistance and have declared their communities autonomous. And so some days before I took this particular photo, I was meeting with the leadership of Fair Trade Coffee Cooperative and a farmer remarked to me, our coffee sells and it sends a message that we are still here. And this is a very different narrative, I think, than the one that's presented as part of fair trade consumption. And I think it raises interesting questions about how fair trade is performed and practiced in the context of resistance. So this picture here is not of the leadership of the cooperative, but actually of a social movement actor, uh, of social movement actors. Uh, this is a Zapatista governing council. Um, how many of you have heard of the Zapatistas? All right, that's more than usual. I'm very excited to see your hands. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Zapatistas, an important thing for you to know is that they're a social movement that has a military arm, but also a civilian uh, arm, and they're populated by indigenous Maya farmers. And uh, these are farmers who are primarily farming corn for subsistence to sustain themselves and their families. 
Uh, they rose up against the Mexican state in 1994 to retain their right to farm the land and the ability to be peasant farmers or campesinos and campesinas as they refer to themselves. So you'll notice that the government council that I met with has their faces covered. Uh, and this is very common for the Zapatistas uh, who wear handkerchiefs and balaclavas to protect their identities. But most importantly, uh, the practice of covering up their faces began in the early 90s as a way of actually being able to be seen. Uh, one uh, member of the cooperative explained to me, without the face covering, I'm just another Indian. And so they distinguish themselves by covering up their faces. Uh, they are a group of people who are in resistance, and they use coffee as one way of reminding people that they still exist and that they're resisting the efforts of the state to remove them from the land and take away their way of life as farmers. So this diagram that I'm presenting here is uh, showing some of the main focal points of the research that I want to present today. But first, I'm going to offer some broader context for the project that this research is situated in. So in this work, I ask questions about how farmers who are linked to anti-capitalist movements and who have declared autonomy from the state are using the fair trade marketplace as a way to maintain their livelihoods and their ability to be social movement actors. And what this means uh, for their work in solidarity with people who are living in very different social, economic, and political situations. So I have here just a few keywords uh, that are situated in, in what I actually think is a problematic Venn diagram that sort of uh, separates the consumer and the producer. Um, but we can see where these identities meet and desires to provide food for their families and their communities through subsistence production and consumption and to live dignified livelihoods uh, while producing for the market. And all of this contributes to the practice of autonomy and resistance in these rebel uh, indigenous communities. So uh, as uh, DeVivo mentioned, I conducted this work in the highlands of Chiapas, Mexico in rebel autonomous indigenous communities. Uh, Chiapas is the southernmost state in Mexico, as you can see. It shares the border with Guatemala. And if you look to the north, you can see uh, the border of Texas, just to situate us a little bit. Uh, I concentrated the vast majority of my work in the highland municipality of Chenhalo, uh, which is uh, noted in, with one of those dots there. Uh, Chiapas is a state about the size of Oregon. And uh, I concentrated, again, my time in the highlands where coffee can be grown. Uh, Chiapas has a majority population of indigenous peoples, and many of them are subsistence corn farmers, meaning that they grow enough food to feed their families and their communities instead of buying food. The Highlands also supports other food production and has the right climate for coffee. Uh, they are a site of resistance as well. And so when you enter these communities, you see signs like this that say, now you're in Zapatista territory where uh, the people rule, which is very different than in other places. Uh, Chiapas, I think, is a really interesting location to look at issues of food and agriculture because of its turbulent land reform history. Uh, this image is a mural, uh, a painting in a Zapatista community. And again, you see the balaclava motif, uh, although this time it's represented through corn, which again is the most important crop in the highlands. Uh, and because of this, having access to land and resources has been an essential element of indigenous uh, demands for years. People have been fighting for the ability to access land since the early 1900s, and especially following the Mexican Revolution. Uh, and so uh, many scholars actually agree that land reform, which is the redistrib redistribution of land, uh, was very contentious in Chiapas. Uh, and at the time of the North American Free uh, Trade Agreement passing uh, and the reforms that happened in Mexico uh, as a result of that, which effectively canceled land reform and made it so people could not gain access to land, there were still thousands of petitions by small farmers for access to land in Chiapas that had yet been unresolved. And this was a highly racialized process, as land was largely held by non-indigenous peoples, and petitions for access to land were largely held by indigenous Maya. So the history of the struggles of land ties to indigenous organizing and demands for uh, self-determination. The inability to obtain secure sources of land and income in early 1970s led to a lot of organizing by farmers and indigenous peoples in uh, Chiapas. And as the constitutionally guaranteed right to land reform was disrupted as a part of the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, the protests of these indigenous groups got louder, eventually erupting in the 1994 uprising of the Zapatistas.
So the research I conducted was with supporters of two different social movements in Chiapas. And these movements were formed out of these experiences of petitioning for the rights to land and self-determination. Uh, the two groups that I worked with were Las Abejas and the Zapatistas. And while I'm not going to take a long detour into the history of these movements and their negotiations with the government in the mid-1990s for indigenous rights and autonomy, I do want to highlight just a couple of important moments to help situate why they're practicing their autonomy in the way that they do and uh, the importance of contemporary farming and income earning strategies in these communities. So in 1992, the pacifist Christian group, the Civil Society of the Bees, which again I'll refer to as Las Abejas, which means the bees in uh, Spanish, uh, they were formed in the highlands to spearhead the right of women to own land. And uh, in 1994, as I already mentioned, the Zapatistas rose up in Chiapas and made visible the demands of farmers in Chiapas. Uh, this photo is of two members of Las Abejas. They're part of the uh, coffee cooperative that I worked with, and they're part of the leadership. And this is a picture that I took one day. And you can see uh, my friend Marcos here is holding a camera. Uh, we were there documenting uh, inappropriate use of chemicals in what was supposed to be an organic certified plot. Uh, they are members of Las Abejas, and uh, the Zapatistas in Las Abejas are in solidarity. Uh, they live and work alongside each other. Uh, and also with groups who oppose their movement. Uh, and uh, since the mid-1990s, the government has waged a low-intensity war against these groups. And at the height of the violence in 1997, 45 men, women, and children were gunned down at a mass for peace. It's an incident that's now known as the massacre at Octayal. As a result of the violence against their groups and the unwillingness of the government to recognize their rights to self-governments, in the early 2000s, both groups shifted from their pursuit of autonomy by petitioning the state for their rights to effectively uh, ignoring the state. And uh, this change was a meaningful one, as they have created a de facto separation, so it's not a legal separation from the state, but they have decided to ignore the state, and they're creating alternatives to the state at the same time. So they don't participate in state-sponsored politics. They don't vote. Uh, they don't receive any funds or subsidies or health care or educational services or any other support from the state. Uh, they remain under threat, though, uh, both from uh, active military and paramilitary activity um, even today. And the pictures that I'm showing you here, this is a very famous photo of a woman uh, who from Las Abejos and, and the women beside her using their bodies as shields to try to keep the Mexican military out of their communities uh, during the height of the violence uh, in 1997. Uh, these other two photos are from a peaceful protest in the uh, former colonial city of San Cristobal de las Casas, which is about two hours away from where I was working. And these are members of the Abejas who are coming to protest the release of the paramilitary members who perpetrated the massacre from prison. Uh, and they are calling on Mexico to recognize their complicity in, in the massacre. So, out of these movements, instead of as a reaction to violence, more fighting or more violence, these movements came together to create co cooperative forms of governance, education, healthcare, and economic activities. So farmers in the highlands have been producing coffee since the early 1960s uh, autonomously, or not autonomously, I shouldn't uh, mix my words, but uh, as independent farmers, not necessarily tied to a plantation. And following the violence in 1997, many of the producers organized themselves into new coffee cooperatives uh, as part of their resistance. And so these cooperatives pooled whatever resources they had in order to support each other and to reach out to broader networks outside of Mexico in order to get support. So out of crisis and violence emerge new forms of organizing and care. And so when discussing this period with a member of the Las Abejas Coffee Cooperative, uh, about Maya Vinique. Maya Vinique is the name of the cooperative of uh, the Abejas. Uh, one of the leadership members talked about it in the context of solidarity. And he said to me, cooperatives are usually created in the context of a certain future possibility, of a certain hope. The cooperative Maya Vinique was founded when there was no hope. There could not have been a worse condition and a worse situation than creating a cooperative in a context of war and displacement. There was a desire to form an organization in fair conditions, but then everything else apart from desire did not exist. There was no money, there were no resources, there was no room, you did not have anything. But a lot of it had to do with overcoming the trauma. 
But then the fair trade certifications and the certification of organic coffee, when those came, we had many solidarity visitors who became clients. And since there's been great support, and maybe Maya Vanique, without the fair trade premiums, might not have been able to have such stable relationships. And these photos that I'm showing you here are uh, uh, evidence of the success of those relationships. Uh, the photo at the top with the bright blue sky is the Maya Vanique bodega up in the highlands. And this is where they take coffee, uh, the, the farmers bring their coffee for intake. And it, this is where it's exported from. Well, it's not exported. It goes onto, onto a truck. And it goes to port, and then it's exported. Uh, and then the uh, photo below is of their uh, roasting facility uh, in San Cristobal de las Casas, uh, where they roast coffee for the domestic marketplace. So while the folks that I work with in Chiapas identify as coffee farmers, they use the sale of their coffee as part of a larger livelihood strategy and a component of their resistance. Uh, this photo here is uh, one of the ways that I like to explain that is that uh, the coffee cooperative, this is a picture from inside the bodega, uh, necessarily has to have people working at it in order to take the coffee in. And so uh, people who are part of the abejas and part of Maya Vanique, they rotate into these paid positions and everybody kind of gets a turn to, to have an income earning opportunity. Uh, I love this picture of Tomas. Uh, he and some of the other bodega workers are mending burlap sacks uh, sort of during downtime when nobody has been bringing in coffee. And I spent a lot of time sitting on the floor talking with these guys. They didn't let me, so they didn't think that I could do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So Maya Vinique, which is similar to their Zapatista counterparts, uh, maintains solidar solidarity relations through their coffee sales. Uh, of course, there are other solidarity connections that exist uh, between the social movements of Las Abejas and the Zapatistas, both within and beyond Mexico. Uh, but for campesinos and campesinas in resistance in the highlands, it's on coffee that the long-term relations of exchange are currently based. And so for our purposes today, I want to take a little bit of time to discuss what solidarity means in coffee exchanges and how this might create possibilities of being in common. So producing for the fair trade label assists with establishing important ties to buyers in the US that allows not only for secure sources of income, but also a critical space for information sharing, uh, support for coffee cooperatives. And, and these relations, uh, it's one of my arguments that uh, it's a very critical component of the practice of solidarity in the Highlands. And so the data that I'm drawing from comes from over a decade of work on fair trade uh, production and multiple trips over three years to the highlands of Chiapas, where I conducted interviews, participant observation, and I participated in a number of coffee cooperative events for the cooperatives that I worked with. Uh, and it was two different coffee cooperatives that I worked with and their members. So if we're going to think about how fair trade solidarity relations may offer possibilities for what I call being in common, we should first think about what that means, right? Especially as it relates to economic exchanges. And I'm going to do just a little bit of theory here so you can see kind of the academic context for, for this work. And so in my research, I draw quite a bit from work on diverse economies theory. Uh, and that's uh, a, a body of theory that was developed by the authors uh, J.K. Gibson Graham. Uh, and very basically, the crux of their ideas is that we should think more about economic exchanges and multiply uh, what we think they are beyond the universal idea that economy equals capitalism. And it is a feminist call to value labor differently, to reconsider work and, what it me and property and what they mean, to think differently about what business and finance is. Uh, and as part of this work, they encourage scholars to think about many types of economic subjectivities and so, in so doing, think about the possibilities of being in common. And this is, this is the diverse economy's iceberg. And what it's trying to tell us is that at the tip, just the stuff that you can see above the water, when we think about economy, we tend to think about presenting ourselves in the marketplace as wage earners. We get a W-2, we contribute to GDP, we pay our taxes. Uh, but that's not the only kind of economic exchange that happens. And so below the iceberg, or below the waterline, you can see that there's a whole big, more lump of ice down there. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's happening. How many of you ever babysat? Washed someone's car? Mowed someone's lawn? Did you get a W-2 for that activity? Right. 
Okay, so there are a lot of different ways that we perform our economic identity or that we care for one another through exchange that isn't captured by what we see above the waterline. And so they're encouraging us to think about economy not just as it relates to capitalism, but as it relates to things that might not exist in a for-profit, wage-producing manner. And so that's where I start from with thinking about possibilities for being in common. Because being in common encompasses an ethical responsibility for being together, for existing together, and occupying the same spaces from the scale of the body to the scale of the global. And, and that is between humans and also our Earth others, so trees, air, water, frogs. Uh, and such relationships are built from connective ontologies or ways of being and trusting relationships. Uh, if we can think for uh, exam an example of Michigan, right? Think about what's happening in Flint right now. What decisions are being made for the communities to be able to access clean water and rights to clean water and rights to live well, while also creating a mutually supportive set of connections around distributing water at the community and household level. People in the community are acting together to lift each other up and in petition and also petition for change in a system that doesn't appear to value them very much. And also being in common is a hopeful space to open up possibilities for a politics of belonging and mutual aid, so aid that helps both parties. It's not enough to promote economic well-being. We have to also think about social and uh, ecological well-being, as well as the political practices and the ethics that shape it. So to be in common requires more of us as citizens of the same planet. And a piece of this puzzle is tied to economic exchanges and the outcomes of our decision making and knowledge production as participants in these economic exchanges. And so how does, or does even fair trade fit into these ideas? Uh, how do coffee exchanges between different groups factor in? And so a key way that I examine this puzzle is thinking through questions about fair trade economic exchanges. So how many of you have heard of fair trade certification before? Okay, great. For, for those of you that know, you can let your attention wander freely. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, for our purposes today, we can think about it as being a lot of different things. But the way we often think about it is as a movement or a market that seeks to reduce the number of actors in the commodity chain, thereby putting more cash in the hands of the people who are producing the commodity. In this case, coffee. It's also an agreement uh, between third-party certifiers and producers regarding social, economic, and environmental standards. For example, reducing child labor and production, guaranteeing a minimum price, uh, producing without using harmful chemicals. And I've just put up, for example, the Fair Trade International standards, which you can see are focused on economic, social, and environmental. Uh, and then these other images are of the different symbols. So you go and you buy a Fair Trade coffee, maybe. There's lots of different labels now. And so I've just put up a couple of examples. Uh, this one here is from Fairtrade USA, and you can see how their uh, symbol has changed over time. Uh, and also now that you can buy composite Fairtrade items. So maybe you're buying something that's Fairtrade certified, but it's only the cotton in the item that's Fairtrade, not everything that went into to making uh, the pair of jeans or whatever that you're purchasing, and so on and so forth. Uh, equal Exchange, which is another important fair trade actor, uh, wants to demonstrate that shortening of the commodity chain in this uh, diagram. And I would say even the conventional commodity chain that they put at the bottom doesn't really tell us the whole story because in a conventional commodity chain, coffee might change hands as many as 155 times before you get it at Dunkin' Donuts. Is there Dunkin' Donuts here? It's a big thing on the East Coast. Huge adjustment for me coming from Oregon. Both? Okay. 155 times before it gets to you, right? Uh, in a fair trade uh, commodity chain, there are far fewer actors. Uh, this doesn't always tell the whole story, but the idea is that uh, the small farmer isn't having to connect up to multiple different uh, groups. Uh, and then the other image that I put on here is of the symbol of the small producers, which is one of the newest fair trade labels that was developed by and for coffee farmers. Uh, as a result of some of the changes in the fair trade marketplace. So the first fair trade items were exchanged in the context of solidarity. They were driven by social movement organizing uh, as a response to unjust and unfair uh, economic trade conditions of free trade. Uh, and that left producers with very little income or mobility. And it's also 
uh, a piece of political and economic regimes, uh, or organizing against political and economic regimes that were harmful to small farmers. The first certification label was devised by a group of Mexican coffee farmers and the Dutch uh, Economic Development Organization called Max Havilar in 1988. Uh, since that time, it's grown to be a multi-billion dollar industry with a number of products from coffee and bananas and tea to composite project products like ice cream and chocolate. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, this, uh, this is a fair trade international advertising uh, bit up here that's showing all of, you know, it's just demonstrating some of the things that you can get fair trade and saying that it's a fair deal for farmers. Uh, these images show some of the variety of goods that are available. I want to draw your attention to this one. This is part of the Fair Moments campaign that took place in October, which is, uh, among other things, uh, Fair Trade Month. And this picture in particular hints a little bit about what I want to talk about today, in that when I ask who Fair Trade is for, uh, I think this image is very telling because it shows, it's meant to describe to you all of the different things that you can buy that are fair trade certified. And what it looks like to me is that there's a relatively affluent white family who gets to enjoy this kind of lifestyle where their sheets are fair trade cotton and their coffee is fair trade and the flowers are fair trade and maybe the kids are fair trade, I'm not sure. Uh, so there's some debate, um, there's, I swear you cannot buy fair trade children. Uh, so there's some debate about whether or not uh, fair trade is a movement or a market. Although there are many certifiers and labels uh, to choose from, in 2011, uh, fair trade certification entered into a moment of divisiveness uh, when the fair trade labeling organization, which was the largest umbrella organization in, uh, to date, they broke apart from uh, Fair Trade USA. And so now we have two big certifiers that are called Fair Trade International and Fair Trade USA. And uh, the reason for this split was that uh, Fair Trade USA wanted to certify coffee plantations so they could extend the benefits of fair trade, uh, as they said, to more people. And uh, some argued that this move would cause the dilution of the standards for fair trade, which are the agreements for how the item will be produced. Uh, and small coffee producers were especially concerned about plantations being certified because uh, they might take away their market share. And they've been fighting that since the inception of fair trade. Uh, and what I've, the pictures that I have here, this is a shade grown plot. Uh, coffee plants like shade, they don't want to be in full sun. Um, yet we've hybridized them uh, so that they can tolerate full sun. And so the picture on the bottom is of a coffee plantation. And so these are very different production systems. But now when you go to buy, if, if you do, a bag of fair trade coffee, it's very difficult to tell the difference between how the coffee was produced because the label doesn't really tell you that. It just tells you that it was fair trade certified. And so all of this uh, led the broader fair trade community to ask, uh, who is the owner of fair trade? And this is a cartoon that uh, was drawn at this time of divisiveness, asking who's the real owner of the fair trade movement? And Fair Trade USA is kind of taking, taking a stand, kind of telling you uh, how that may have been functioning for people during this time period. So, Many of you who have already heard about fair trade may have heard that it is a way to connect producers and consumers. It's a powerful idea that is supported by certifiers and proponents of fair trade, but it's one that I actually want to disrupt a little bit today. Not to suggest that it isn't a great idea. Uh, it's built on the possibilities of being in common. But fair trade exchanges, I think, are very uneven. And uh, the idea that we can simply buy our way to a better world uh, is fairly unrealistic. And so the fair trade market, I argue, is built on asymmetrical or uneven power relations that in order for it to exist requires that there is a marginalized producer. Right? Somebody has to be doing badly so we can invest in that community. Uh, a fair trade purchase is considered an ethical uh, purchase and a way to demonstrate solidarity. But I ask questions such as, how does solidarity function as a component of economic exchange? Are consumers buying their way to solidarity through ethically minded purchases? Are, uh, are consumers paying coffee importers to do their solidarity for them? Uh, and I think that these kinds of questions raise others about the social spaces that are uh, created through fair trade exchanges and interdependence in economic exchanges and really what solidarity can mean in this context. And the photos that I have up here, I'll just uh, zoom to one of them. These are advertising campaigns by Fair Trade USA, which shows 
uh, the producer uh, juxtaposed against the consumer who's enjoying their product. And this, again, is supposed to be demonstrating that producer-consumer connection. Uh, so I want to think a little bit about what solidarity means in this context. Uh, historically, solidarity movements in the Americas were tied to awareness campaigns and protesting Central and South American dictatorships and military regimes in the 1960s and 1980s, uh, and also to action supporting historic grievances regarding land tenure and social inequalities in the region. So these groups attempted to give an international voice to those whose voices were being stifled in their own countries. And a number of solidarity movements were found, formed in the context of resistance and struggles in places such as southern Mexico and Colombia, for example. Solidarity is practiced in a number of different ways. Uh, it might be through boycotts or sit-ins or demonstrations. Uh, it might also be through being present, uh, accompaniment, information sharing. And more recently, it's been articulated as something that you can do on behalf of others through uh, exercising purchasing power. So solidarity, uh, though, is also been characterized as being problematic um, by creating subject-object relationships or having the problem of speaking for others or taking on the role of a helper. And there's a particular whiteness to helper solidarity that really entrenched the offer of help or uh, the offer uh, that is seated in long-standing and unequal race relations that position white bodies as helping bodies and brown bodies as recipient bodies. And, uh, and so I think solidarity is a slippery concept, uh, but at its foundation, it's working to make visible uh, and mitigate oppression. And so what I want to suggest here today is that solidarity doesn't mean the same thing to all actors. I think this ad uh, demonstrates that a little bit more. Uh, her hard work equals your new look, right? That's a very different form of solidarity than maybe participating in a boycott or a sit-in. And again, I would argue that this is a helper form of solidarity, which is not uh, mutual aid, uh, but is instead dependent on continued disparity between the actors who are participating. And this is something uh, that I call the buy and let live of fair trade. Um, which effectively calls on an ethical commitment by a wealthy consumer to purchase commodities from an impoverished producer. And as part of their participation, those who are purchasing coffee are enfolded into an imaginary producer-consumer community whereby their perceived participation takes place not only through drinking coffee, but through their purchase. And they're told that they're helping an entire community's day-to-day -day life just by drinking coffee every day. Uh, the reality of how these exchanges happen uh, disrupts the imagined community that's described in fair trade marketing campaigns, and which promote connections between individual coffee purchasers and uh, producers. Consumer practices of purchasing in ethical and informed ways fall on the margin of fair trade networks. Uh, consumers are not dependent on any one coffee farmer to get their ethical purchasing fix. Uh, and their performance is bound to purchasing a gourmet or luxury item that could come from any number of possible producers. So when discussing this with uh, campesinos and campesinas, we often talked about price. So one campesino said to me, this year it's a really low price. If we need to buy something at the store or medicine, the price keeps increasing, but the coffee price does not go up. In the fair trade exchange imaginary, one group is using their accumulated wealth to facilitate the life and livelihood of another group. The purchase of coffee at a premium tends to not put very much financial strain on the part of the purchaser, yet the greater share of income that's being retained by the producer usually just allows them to stand in place. There's very little mobility. So this result doesn't come as a particular surprise, uh, but is instead consistent with seeking to understand economic exchanges uh, in their multiplicity and their fluidity. Um, how can we reconcile helper forms of solidarity, which require very little um, action from coffee purchasers, with those possibilities of being in common that I talked about at the beginning, which require interdependence and mutual aid? Uh, and what I want to suggest here is that the asymmetrical or imbalanced relations of individuals making an ethical commitment to support fair trade uh, there are these uncertainties, and there are ambivalences, and there are disappointments in that. But at the same time, these actions demonstrate multiple meanings and understandings of possibilities of being in common. And so I want to think now about how producers play into this messy reality. Right? I started us out in the corn and coffee fields of Chiapas, and I had to zoom way out to tell this story, which I think at this point 
makes it almost seem like the producers are an afterthought, which tells us a lot about who fair trade is for. <laughs> um, simultaneously, though, I argue that producers push back against this normalizing and homogenizing narrative, uh, and they deploy fair trade to suit their purposes. And this is a big part also of who gets to decide what fair trade is. So we often hear about the fair trade movement, and it is here that I really want to think about the idea of fair trade in movement. As I introduced in the beginning, uh, the farmers who I worked with are part of social movements. And their primary goal is to live dignified livelihoods uh, as indigenous subsistence farmers. In this way, they push back against what fair trade is and how they can use it. And this is what I think is most important to thinking about fair trade in movement as something that has momentum for change. Uh, the idea of cultivating fairer forms of exchange seems, in the case of third party certification, to have become stalled by ideas of economic development and how it should look. And these universal ideas of uh, moving towards a high mass consumption uh, existence. And so this, and, and also this is in this contradiction because again, for fair trade to exist, those people need to not progress to that uh, high mass consumption existence. So what do these communities look like? Uh, how do they engage with fair trade and how do their relations foster possibilities for being in common? So over three years and many cups of coffee, uh, I learned that fair trade agricultural production is really just another part of everyday life for farmers. Uh, one of the campesinos that I spoke with talked about the fact that uh, they are coffee farmers, right? We are coffee farmers who became organized so we could work on our own and better, so we could feed our families. In this case, fair trade is mostly an afterthought. Uh, and this was followed uh, by the importance of their cooperative. So another producer expressed this after we were discussing the fair trade price for the year, saying, through our cooperative, we sell the coffee, and through them we get the best price, a better price, we agree to be here and to produce in certain ways. If there was a drop in price before, it would hurt our families. We couldn't help our families. And so that fair trade price floor really does help people from falling deeper into poverty, but again, it keeps them at that, that, that level. So, oh, and this picture here um, is of one of the farmers standing next to his coffee, a uh, depulper, which was an investment uh, by the cooperative in the coffee farmers. Uh, and that's part of the process of uh, getting coffee ready for market, is depulping it for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, so simultaneously, campesinos reflect on fair trade not being a living wage and the sorrow of not having enough land to produce corn and having to purchase it uh, before the next harvest. So fair trade doesn't fully insulate the campesinos and campesinas in resistance from every, the, the realities of everyday life. Uh, as one campesino remarked to me, you can't eat coffee. Uh, however, pushing back against the narratives of a marginalized producer uh, we can look to another comment from a producer who told me, it's a future that we construct to counter the deconstruction, and it's a way to get respect. And so in this case, the farmer is explaining how the market seeks to make them invisible behind the packaging. And so they push back through fair trade to be seen and be recognized and to get respect for their labor and production practices. And so one of the key ways that this takes place is through the connection to their cooperatives and the connections to coffee roasters in the United States. Uh, the connection to the cooperative is one that's highlighted quite a lot by campesinos, especially in relation to the height of violence. Uh, this picture here is, uh, uh, this is what they do. They pile the coffee up, uh, part of intake. That's 150 pounds um, on his back. <laughs> uh, so in the context of the violence, people talk to me about the creation of the cooperative. And one campesino said, we were displaced people, my family, between 1998 and 2001 because of the violence, but we came back to our place and we joined our organization and we began producing again. And so these principles of solidarity and the connection to fair trade doesn't really factor into the importance of the cooperative for the majority of the people that I spoke with. One other campesino said, you know, our organization is good because even though the price changes, because there's a fair trade price floor, but the New York price continues to fluctuate. So it might be higher than the price floor some years and then it might drop to the price floor in other years. And so this campesino said, even though the price changes, in the world we have our price of Maya Vanique and we have our cooperative. And that's much better than the coyotes, uh, who he went on to say, who rob you. And the coyotes are the intermediaries that pay a very low price for coffee when folks aren't connected to cooperatives. So when I discuss uh, coffee production under fair trade certification, 
Again, it came to the price into the cooperative, but right now, sitting on my kitchen counter is a bag with the words Maya Vanique on it. Uh, I purchased this coffee in the United States from the coffee roaster Higher Grounds from Traverse City, Michigan. Ah, all right. Uh, when I go to their website, I can find this coffee. It's coffee produced by the people I worked with. Uh, their coffee is not blended into obscurity and called some other thing. Instead, it's sold with their story, uh, the story of struggle for autonomy, and the story of their time during the massacre at Octayal. The founding members of the Highlands, as part of solidarity organizing, uh, talked with folks who came to Chiapas and said, one of the best things you could do for us is sell our coffee. And so Chris Treeter of Michigan went home and started a coffee roasting uh, uh, business. Like, that wasn't what he had intended to do, but the farmer said, you, could you sell our coffee? And so that's what he did. Um, and this is what he had to say about being able to tell stories. He said, right now we live in a moment in time where storytelling that ties back to the farmers is a huge piece, the inspiration and the struggle. It's something that people will be riveted by, but there's so much more we need to be doing to tell an authentic story. This is where the opportunity lies, but only when you have authentic relationships. And so these ideas suggest that we have to ask questions about the type of economic relations that we want to participate in and about how we want to bring meaning to or not our economic practices and performances. Uh, the economic exchange that prioritizes life and livelihood is more likely the one between the coffee producers and their cooperative and the cooperative and the coffee roasters, for example, here in Michigan. Uh, these groups establish relationships, connections. They co-create knowledge. They tell stories. They share coffee. Uh, and though even though power and privilege still create distance between these groups, these exchanges speak to a politics of the possible and provide an opportunity to consider what being in common could start from. And so as the producer cooperatives struggle to remain visible under threat, sharing their stories through the sale of coffee is one strategy. So this final picture, uh, I'll explain in a second. <laughs> uh, a diverse and community economies approach to making trade fair doesn't mean that we don't have to engage these messy and entangled power dynamics that exist within these larger networks. But even as multiple economic identities are recognized, uh, we also have to understand that we're all in the process of becoming. Uh, this piece is crucial, right? It's a demand that we must make upon ourselves and others so that we stay in movement and we don't affix an identity to others, but instead allow such identities to be fluid, to break away, so we're not always thinking about a marginalized producer. Uh, Fair trade activism means, uh, if, if fair trade activism means promoting products made by the poor and the powerless for, by people in some arbitrary place, maybe we call the global south, uh, that's not very helpful, right? But instead, we consider fair trade as a site of mutual aid and interdependence, where we work in solidarity with others and exchange uh, ideas and challenge inequities, which might be tied to any number of oppressions. Uh, for example, uh, this image here, which I can't make any bigger, uh, is from this, one of the Zapatista cooperatives. And they worked across their autonomous zones in solidarity with those in the United States who are protesting the border wall. And they sent all of their coffee to folks in the United States to sell to help support their efforts to protest the border wall. So they, they spent their year's income basically to help people in solidarity in the United States. Uh, so to consider fair trade and movement shines a different light on the questions of what fair trade is, who it's for, and who gets to decide. If we critically reflect on our economic exchanges as sites of potential solidarity and we ask difficult questions about what it means to be in common, we open up sites not just of disappointment, but also of hope and possibility. Uh, and so thinking about fair trade and movement diverts us from thinking about the universal narrative of fair trade being for marginalized producers. So what I want to leave you with today That was a very dramatic pause. What I want to leave you with today uh, is an entreaty from the end of my book. And I'm going to, I'm going to read uh, the last few lines from my book to you today. When I discuss the research that I conducted with fair rebels in Chiapas and the complex realities behind the fair trade label, I am often asked by people, what kind of coffee should I buy? From their perspective, I imagine I'm giving a very unsatisfying answer. What kind of economic exchanges do you want to have? 
Their dissatisfaction stems from my attempts to encourage them to have more engaging forms of economic exchange. I tell people to look behind the labels, to not rely on branding, and to think about the type of interactions that they want to have in the marketplace. I answer their question with a question, knowing that the request to undertake the difficult task of learning about production and production practices while holding themselves responsible. It is a hopeful request that we as human beings will participate more deeply in making the world a better place in, and finding more equitable ways to live. However, as someone who is rethinking and reframing and rereading economic exchange as sites of difference, I recognize the hard work that this participation will take. It means con confronting the structures that give power to particular groups of people, white supremacy and privilege, the patriarchy, heteronormativity, and the colonial imperial political relations that we see across the globe. For some of us, it means recognizing our places in broader structures of oppression and relinquishing our power. It is not up to the people you see on your bag of coffee to do this work for you. We are constantly in the processes of becoming, of learning, and of seeking mutual aid. And we do this from different geographies. But we are all citizens of the earth. And so we can't face our roles anxiously. We have to face them from places of strength together. Thank you very much. Lindsay, thank you so much for a very provocative discussion on, uh, on fair trade and coffee and Chiapas. It's captivating, especially with the conclusion that <laughs> tasks us all to consider being responsible global citizens as, uh, as we should be, as we should be. I'll open the floor for questions if anybody has any, and you know, I'll ask you to ponder. I'll, oh, I'll come over there. I was going to ask one, but now I have to walk by you here, folks. Oh, OK. <laughs> She's going to pass the mic. <laughs> I have two questions. OK, I'll try to keep track of them. One, what is the obesity rate between the indigenous peoples who are involved in these workers' communes and the other indigenous people who aren't? OK. And my second question is, what is the what is like the the tax policy with these illegal communes trading coffee internationally with the Mexican government? I'm going to answer your first or first question second. Uh, so this is messy, right? Uh, and so the groups in the highlands they don't interact with the government uh, so much, uh, but the groups in the city are the ones that are kind of entangled with the government. So they are paying taxes. There was a Zapatista cooperative that was trying very hard to not pay taxes, and they got all of their equipment confiscated. And so that cooperative doesn't exist anymore. So they realized that that was one piece of the government that they couldn't not deal with. But the folks, the everyday kind of on the ground folks, they don't deal with that. Uh, and I wouldn't call them communes. They're definitely cooperatives. They're sites of cooperative production, of cooperative learning. Uh, they are uh, pooling their resources together. Uh, to answer your first question, uh, very simply, I could avoid it by saying I don't know. Right? I don't have the rates of obesity for southern Mexico. That's not my area of research. Um, but I can tell you that as one of the results of the organizing that happened uh, when uh, they were fighting for the possibilities of self-determination autonomy, the women in the communities made the decision that the community should be dry. And so there was no longer going to be alcohol production or consumption in these communities. Because in order to have a social movement and an uprising, you need to be sober. And so, uh, and that remains true to date. So all of the civilian communities are without alcohol, arms, or drugs. And so uh, what that means is that uh, in times of celebration or in times of uh, having some income coming in, uh, these folks are largely spending their money on Coca-Cola products or Pepsi products, and they are pervasive in the highlands. So that's contributing to things like type 2 diabetes and an increase in uh, the rates of obesity, but not the way that we're seeing it in other places in Mexico. Uh, and I can't tell you how it differs from other uh, communities. But uh, the influx of uh, uh, mass-produced, hyper-industrialized food is a reality for everywhere in the world. And it's these communities, just because they're autonomous, doesn't mean that they're isolated. Thank Lin you. Lindsay, I have a question for you <laughs> that you, that you um, well, or, or I have a request for you, and that is to please elaborate on 
the role of female empowerment, if you don't mind, in these indigenous communities, yeah. which is quite unlike we, what we might see throughout the rest of the country, or at least in the northern part of the country. Yeah, so uh, Zapatistas in particular, I'm going to focus just on the Zapatistas right now, uh, have had a very, very strong showing of women. Women were uh, initially part of the uprising and the movement. They are part of the Comandancia. They are part of all of the leadership. Uh, if we go back to the photo at the beginning, you'll see that there are two women sitting on the leadership council. Uh, in the late 90s, uh, a group of women came together who were affiliated with the social movement and wrote the Law on the Rights of Women, which talks about things like uh, reproductive rights and being able to make decisions about family planning, uh, about the right to a non-abusive household, uh, about the right to participate in the economic activities and the social activities uh, without uh, there being gender disparities. and so. Uh, in all of the pursuits that are part of autonomous governments, which is uh, healthcare, agroecology promotion, uh, and education, there are both men and women in all of those roles. Uh, there are always men and women in the governing council. Uh, and I do not point to this and, and try to romanticize it. It's not perfect. But the piece that I think is most important is that it is recognized, and it is talked about, and it's talked about all over uh, the highlands and autonomous communities, and it is something that, uh, as part of their solidarity and working together, Las Abejas and Zapatistas are working together on as well. And remember, Las Abejas was actually founded uh, to help women secure their right to land. It was after a dispute where, uh, with an inheritance, and they didn't want the land to go to the young women in the family, and they, so that was how Las Abejas started. Uh, and so it is part of the conversation, and it's a conversation that's taking very different forms because it is led by the women. And uh, very recently, uh, there was a women's gathering where they were inviting women from all over the world to come and to have dialogue. So uh, they're trying very much uh, to be in solidarity with other groups, right? It's, not, it's never just been about their groups. Uh, it's about achieving equity across the globe. Would, would you say that one of the <laughs> elements of their question. solidarity <laughs> is uh, associated with, with their, um, their language, their dialect? Does that unite them tighter than they might be if they were in another part of the country? So there are a lot of indigenous languages in Mexico. Uh, in the highlands or in Chiapas state, the five most spoken are well, I'm not going to go through them, but there are five that are predominantly spoken. And one of the most incredible things about what happened in 1994, uh, which after the uprising and after, after the, 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 the uprising itself ended and they started to have dialogues for peace with the government, uh, there was a meeting of the International Indigenous Congress. And it brought together these five language groups in a way that they hadn't them brought together before. So yeah, it's incredibly important. Um, but it also means a lot of struggle to understand each other because like Sotil and Saltal, they maybe you're communicating the maybe well, no, I don't want to make comparisons, but um, but Chol is very, very difficult and very different, and Toholoval is very difficult and very different. And so it's really uh, been one another piece of the struggle is mm -hmm. to actually work together across these five different languages and and, and additionally others that I haven't mentioned. We have time for one more question. Uh, go ahead. Would you say the struggle between the Zapitas and the government is still a physical problem? Like, are they? St is what's the level of fighting that they do? I guess. There is a very long answer that I will give you. I'll try to give a short one since we're short on time. Uh, these these folks are still under threat, very much so. Um, the major way that the Mexican government feeds that threat is by arming people in the communities. So when I talk about autonomous areas, I'm not drawing a box around a community and saying, they're all autonomous. There are people in that community who are not part of their movement. And, uh, and so there are people who are opposing that. And the government is giving things to those people. Uh, and it might be guns to threaten people with, but it might also be latrines or concrete floors or uh, bedding or refrigerators. Uh, and they use those economic goods to incentivize people away from the movement. So there's both economic and physical violence. The 
military arm of the Zapatistas, they're in hiding in the jungle still, and they will not give up their arms. There hasn't been any fighting. They have not used their, uh, their weapons since 1994, but they still exist, and they're still in hiding from the government and are under threat. Uh, and the communities are under threat. Where I worked, uh, there was a military patrol that went by every day. Uh, in the three years that I was there, uh, there was not a lot of uh, educational uh, support in the Highlands when I started, well, for a very, very long time. In 2010, there wasn't a government school uh, next to the Zapatista uh, government center. Um, by the time I left in 2013, they had built one right outside. And that's just another form of violence, really. So yeah, I would say that the threat is pretty present. Um, they're trying to build a highway through the autonomous communities now, and so there's been a lot of protests and people are being injured. It's, it's not good right now, but yeah. That's a really bad question to answer, <laughs> end on. I mean, it was a great question, but I just didn't want to depress everybody. Yes, there is violence. <laughs> well, the, there is violence, but, but please, lastly, you know, re re remark on some of these elements of oppression that these indigenous people must uh, endure, such as the road that's being Yeah. Uh, built. So I, I talk about that a lot. Uh, I would say, so I'm pointing to this in, in, in a way that I hope is hopeful, uh, but it is a struggle every day to maintain their existence in a uh, state that thinks that subsistence farming and coffee farming on a small scale is not a productive practice. That doesn't look like the economy that we want to be. And so they're struggling against uh, their very existence being denied at all times. So I feel like that was much more hopeful. There we go. All right. Well, Lindsay, thank you so very much. If you have further questions, please come and see her uh, in just a few moments. Let's give a round of applause for Dr. Naylor, please. Thank you so much.